today. Interesting. The uh, title of uh, his talk is Russia after the USSR, Imperialism on the Periphery. So, here you go, Boris. It's yours. Uh, thank you, Sabri. Uh, and, of course, uh, we are now going to cover uh, a period which is already historically rather long because, yes, it's about 30 years. It's more than 30 years by now. Uh, since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it is also very interesting that, uh, of course, uh, the main characteristic of this uh, development uh, of, of this period is uh, that capitalism was restored in Russia. That's uh, one thing which is quite obvious. And the second thing which is also very important is that capitalism uh, emerged uh, in Russia in uh, the form of uh, peripheral capitalism, uh, which was also quite predictable and logical. Uh, but of course, also we have to understand that uh, when the uh, Soviet system was disintegrating and uh, Russian society was uh, leading uh, towards uh, capitalist restoration, uh, the general expectation was totally different. Uh, people expected to, that they were going to become part of the center. Uh, of course, uh, to be more specific, people didn't understand that there was uh, the very the very kind of reality of center periphery uh, structure within capitalism. Uh, so uh, they just thought that capitalism was something which existed in Western Europe and uh, North America. Uh, there was very little idea of what capitalism was about outside the West, or it was seen as just communist propaganda, or uh, just people didn't care, uh, mostly for, let me be honest, racist, uh, uh, racist reasons, because uh, they thought that we shouldn't care about those people outside Europe because we are Europeans, and, uh, well, uh, that's, uh, that about, that's about it. Uh, so uh, approximately about that time, I uh, wrote that uh, the feeling of uh, those uh, people who expected uh, that capitalism was going to bring about some prosperity, democracy, and all other good things imaginable, uh, that these people would be extremely disappointed by the reality of capitalism as it's going to uh, happen in Russia, and they would feel approximately like those people who booked a plane ticket for Stockholm and all of a sudden discovered that the plane was actually flying to, say, Burkina Faso or, or some other place in, in Africa. And actually, that was very much the, the feeling of uh, quite a few people, but it doesn't mean that necessarily those frustrated people beca became uh, leftists or became uh, radical critics of the system. Uh, they were uh, just looking for someone to blame. Uh, and of course, um, depending on what was uh, their inclination, uh, the answers differed. Uh, so somebody blamed uh, Jews, of course, that's quite traditional. Uh, somebody blamed corruption. Somebody blamed former communists who were still in charge. Uh, others blamed uh, security services like fa the famous KGB, which now exists under the name of FSB. Uh, and, well, of course, they said, well, these people from the security apparatus, they control everything. And finally, uh, quite a few people, including those on the left, were just blaming oligarchy as just a group of people who were making everything uh, wrong while in fact uh, there could be some other scenario, some other solution, if not for these people who were uh, just evil, corrupt, and uh, uh, badly educated or irresponsible, unpatriotic, and so on and so on and so on. However, if we are looking at these events in a more uh, logical and more kind of uh, serious way, then we have to discover that First, the transition was uh, quite logical, and uh, in a certain sense, it was extremely successful. The irony is exactly that if we are looking at Russian capitalism, not from the point of view of those people who 
uh, lived in Russia, uh, uh, or from the point of view of those expectations which were associated with the restoration of capitalism. But from the point of view of uh, um, neoliberal economists, for example, uh, who were um, proposing and advocating uh, reintegration of uh, Russia and other post-Soviet republics into the global capitalist economy, then we should see that as a success story. Uh, because uh, Russia did not only integrate reintegrate it into the global capitalist economy, but it did discover its own niche within this economy and to some extent and up to certain a certain period. This niche was pretty successful. The problem is uh, uh, not with the niche. The problem was more with, with the capitalist system because the uh, benefits which were acquired uh, because of this integration, of course, were uh, divided in a very unequal uh, and uh, uneven way. But that's what capitalism is about. Otherwise, there was no cap There would have been no capitalism. Uh, so what was the, that niche and what was specific about Russia? By the way, making Russia different, not only compared to, say, China or Vietnam, uh, who were also moving uh, uh, into the very same direction and reintegrating into capitalism about the same period of time, but also compared to places like, uh, say, uh, Ukraine, for example, uh, and uh and some other post-Soviet republics. Uh, also, on the other hand, what makes Russia different from, uh, uh, from say, Uzbekistan or Moldova even? Uh, so, uh, that first, we should look at the Chinese model of integration to understand the uh, process. Uh, Chinese post-communist uh, regime, which continues to claim uh, that it is still communist, but of course there is very little communist or socialist in this regime except for the red flag and the authoritarian, uh, non-democratic forms of government. So this uh, post-Maoist, post let's put it this way, China, uh, was uh, entering the global economy, offering uh, some resources uh, to the global economy. So the same thing was happening with Russia, with Kazakhstan, with uh, Ukraine, with with, every, with almost everyone. So if you have to join the global economy, first thing you have to do is to offer certain resources, certain uh, products, and uh, uh, certain competitive advantages, uh, or present yourself with certain competitive advantages. Uh, remember the famous Ricardian theorem, that you should produce and uh, export and uh, uh, promote uh, the sectors uh, where uh, you are the, uh, the, uh, the strongest. Uh, so what was a uh, very important, uh, very central uh, element uh, for the Chinese success story? Uh, China offered its uh, labor force to the global economy. Uh, China doesn't have uh, lots of uh, mineral resources. It has some, of course. Uh, it possesses a certain uh, base for its industry, but it's not excessive. It's just enough for the development of Chinese industry itself. And as we know, China is now a major importer of uh, raw materials and uh, mineral and other resources. Uh, but China uh, possessed enormous numbers of people huge resources uh, of labor. Uh, and not only there were so many people, uh, it also was a disciplined, organized, and controlled labor force. Uh, and what was the outcome? The result was the development of industry, because once you have disciplined, developed, uh, disciplined and, discipl uh, and uh, controlled uh, and massive labor force, the best way you can uh, use it and put it to the use of the of the global capitalist system is to uh, build factories, uh, build roads, uh, increase export capacity, and so on and so on. So in that sense, Chinese reintegration into the global capitalist economy was accompanied with very dramatic modernization 
all the uh, Chinese society, industry, and so on and so on. So in that sense, whether we like capitalism or not, whether we're critical or positive about neoliberalism, at least uh, there were definitely some positive elements to that. Uh, from the point of view of Chinese uh, economic development, what, what we see is China is turning into a major um, major producer at the global level, an economic superpower, and so on and so on. What was happening to Russia, uh, in a certain sense, was exactly the same, and in some way, it was exactly the opposite. What was the same? Russian elites were also trying to reintegrate uh, the economy into the global system. But what were the resources which Russia offered to the global system? Uh, these were mostly mineral resources, energy, raw materials, um, of course, uh, Russian forestry, um, oil, gas, uh, coal, um, and so on, uh, other minerals. Uh, so Russian labor force was excessively huge, excessively large for that kind of economy. Uh, because uh, if you want to sell uh, oil, gas, and, and so on and so on, uh, your own industry uh, is not only unnecessary, your own industry, which consumes the very same resources, is becoming a problem. It should be uh, gradually eliminated or at least cut, massively cut, uh, to uh, release the resources for the global market. And uh, of course, uh, that led to uh, the process of uh, restructuring which was accompanied uh, with a massive deindustrialization, also by radical primitivization of the economy, uh, because uh, that also means that if you have less industry, uh, you have uh, less uh, production at home, uh, you also need uh, less technology, you need uh, less science, you need less education, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Russian society was deteriorating, was declining and uh, degenerating uh, for years, years after years after years. Uh, but at the same time, Russian capital was doing extremely well because uh, these uh, raw materials and energy uh, resources which were released to the global market were really needed. There was a demand for these goods, for these resources. So the demand was actually increasing gradually and uh, it peaked about 2007, uh, exactly before the, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, but it's still, it used to be at least till the, this current war with Ukraine, it used to be quite considerable. Uh, so in that sense, uh, capital accumulation in Russia continued. Uh, resources which were exported abroad also brought uh, a lot of foreign currency into the country, into the economy, which led to a very fast accumulation of capital in Russia. So Russian bourgeoisie and so-called oligarchs not only became rich, uh, they really accumulated huge resources. We'll come back to that point because uh, by the mid 2000s 10, 2000, uh, 2010th, uh, we also discovered that uh, this accumulation was excessive. There was this phenomenon of overaccumulation of the capital very much along the lines uh, uh, with uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, studies in the early 20th century. So, but we'll come back to that point. So, but uh, at this point, what is important is that uh, Russian capitalism uh, within its own logic was pretty successful. And even though it was uh, accompanied with the impoverishment of considerable part of the population, uh, it also brought about some positive development, at least within its uh, own logic, as I told you, including the establishment of new, um, of new businesses, quite a few new businesses, because of course there was money coming into the country, 
Uh, there were these famous petrodollars uh, showering on the Russian oligarchy. And that also led to their... Uh, um, uh, to uh, to the development of a of a specific kind, because uh, of course, uh, where there is money, uh, there is a growing domestic market. So at least the uh, the market for the imported goods, which are in many ways replacing the domestically produced goods, uh, was growing. Uh, but that also means that new businesses emerged. Like uh, there were businesses uh, in the tourist sector, in I don't know, uh, services, uh, restaurants, um, entertainment, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so there were jobs also. So it means that, well, of course, enterprises were closing down, uh, uh, big factories were closing down, some of the factory towns were. Uh, were in total depression uh, and were just uh, turning into real, real nightmare places. Uh, this kind of, uh, our, uh, I don't know what uh, can be seen as a depressive, uh, depressive belt of, of the former industrial uh, cities in Russia, which can be to some extent compared to what was happening in some old uh, other old industrial countries, including some areas of the United States of America uh, and some areas of Northern Britain, for example, and so on. However, as I told you before, uh, there were also certain sectors of the economy which were developing, which were doing uh, rather well and which were uh, progressing. Uh, there was some demand for, for these jobs. Also, the uh, again, as I told you, uh, it doesn't mean that Russian science completely collapsed. There were also some segments which continued to develop, uh, partly because of the international demand, because of Russian scientists are great specialists who were in demand internationally. So in that sense, ironically, while actual in, uh, scientific institutions were decomposing and uh, were uh, often um, shut down, uh, Technical education was not uh, completely destroyed uh, because there was a global demand, uh, international demand for these specialists, which were produced by their uh, universities in, in Russia. So that says uh, they started exporting people. So they, um, they can, what, what they were doing, they were educating people to export them, to send them later abroad or to make them work for foreign companies. Some of them even, some of these people even stayed at home in Russia, but started working for foreign companies and so on and so on. So again, as I told you before, uh, this general trend towards deindustrialization, uh, primitivization, uh, degeneration of the economy didn't mean that everything was just decomposing or collapsing or and so on. So uh, as English people say, nothing fails like failure, nothing succeeds like success. So in that sense, uh, it's a much more um, complex and contradictory picture. And you shouldn't see that uh, just in black and white uh, colors. It, it was much more, uh, much more uh, multicolored, so to speak. So what was happening to uh, Russian uh, political and uh, social structure during uh, these periods? Actually, I said these periods because there were at least three major periods in the development of Russian capitalism, and that's also very important. Uh, so the first period was uh, the period of decomposition, destruction, not so creative destruction, mostly just destruction, though elements of Schumpeterian creative destruction also you could find there, but um, I should say it was, uh, there was cre creative destruction with more destruction than creation. Uh, but uh, what was important for that period? That was the period of uh, oligarchy competition. There were uh, different groups of oligarchs which were actually competing uh, for the resources. They were fighting each other and uh, competing with each other to take over existing pieces of economy. And uh, uh, well, uh, they were always in conflict within each other, but they were also uh, together, they were in conflict with the people especially to, with those groups at the bottom of society, which were uh, kind of uh, complete losers in this game. 
And, uh, you know, the, the number of losers was definitely by far, by far bigger than the number of winners during that period. Also, that period ideologically was character, uh, characterized with extreme anti-communism and anti-Sovietism, but, but it was also extremely logical because, for example, you have to uh, take over a factory, a state-owned factory, uh, and you are going to take it for like probably 1% of its uh, actual uh, actual price. Um, because even, even if you're going to close down the factory, uh, there is metal, there are there are engines, there are uh, there is equipment, there are buildings and so on. So even when you're going to destroy it, uh, you still need uh, some stuff from this place. And uh, uh, first you're coming there and you you are saying, look, uh, this factory is a mess. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, you have to be happy that I'm going to pay at least one percent of the of the uh, what you what what is supposedly going to be a, uh, the market price for 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 the for the metal for the scrap metal uh, in which I will turn the, the the production lines and so on. Uh, so in that sense, everything Soviet, everything communist was terrible. It was just a waste of resources and uh, the system was completely rotten and, and so on. Uh, and uh, politically also that period was the period when uh, there was, of course, no democracy, but there was much more freedom because these groups were competing each other. That meant they were creating certain spaces where objectively there was some sort of pluralism of not of ideas so much, but at least of interests which are fighting each other. Uh, Dimitrina Petrova, a, a Bulgarian sociologist, many, many years ago called that freedom without democracy. So that was a very good characteristic of what used to be a, a Russian and partly post Soviet uh, political system in the 1990s. Uh, so uh, the people were not so much involved in, in these events, but oligarchs were at least creating certain spaces for journalists, uh, uh, some kind of, uh, I shouldn't say free journalism, but at least uh, uh, aggressive, active journalism and so on. So quite a few people, including some intellectuals, see the, nine, the 1990s as a, as a good time, at least from their point of view, for the majority of the people, it was very different. Uh, then, however, in 1998, uh, the famous default happened when uh, the ruble collapsed. And after the collapse of the ruble, ironically, Russian capitalism uh, stabilized uh, also in terms of its domestic production. That was the golden period for, uh, I shouldn't say for reindustrialization, because no real industrialization happened, but at least the destruction of industry uh, some some way in some way slowed down uh, because uh, when the ruble collapsed all russian products suddenly became very very competitive um, if you have your currency uh, depreciated uh, 10 times within sometimes uh, well actually not 10 times i exaggerate but well Look, it used to be uh, six rubles to one dollar. Then within days, it was already 12 to one, so two times. And then within a few months, it was 30 to one. So imagine. Yeah? So it was, uh, yes, it was five times. Five times within like three or four months. So imagine how competitive Russian products became. So to some extent, it stabilized the domestic production and domestic market. And uh, interestingly enough, almost about this, that very period of time, mm, transition, first transition happened when Yeltsin left, President Yeltsin, who presided over the destruction of the Soviet Union and the destruction of the Soviet economy, uh, Boris Yeltsin left, and uh, President Putin was installed. Of course, he was installed by the very same people behind uh, Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin himself, as you know, nominated Putin as his successor. And uh, then we see the second phase of Russian capitalism, because as I told you, the first phase was this period of uh, very anarchic, 
uh, disorganized oligarchy competition, uh, which also involved uh, some level of freedom, uh, at least for specific uh, groups of the population. Uh, then what we get next is uh, uh, the second period, which I call uh, the corporate period. Uh, when Putin arrived, uh, Putin arrived with a team of managers. Also, they tried to stabilize uh, the way uh, the state and the, uh, the elite functioned. Instead of wild competition, this war of everyone against everyone, uh, the Hobbesian movement was really um, taking place. It was extremely Hobbesian. But of course, not for the society as a whole, but for, for the elite. So uh, some kind of social contract was taking place, was established uh, by and around Putin. Uh, Putin personally played a rather instrumental role in, in all that because he was just needed uh, as some kind of person to kind of guarantee that the contract is going to be carried out some in some way. Uh, so what was the contract? First, of course, uh, they... Uh, decided that the elite groups shouldn't shouldn't fight each other anymore. They should stop fighting each other, uh, which was also logical because, look, uh, now there are more and more resources. By the way, look, uh, about the same time, the price of oil internationally started growing, and it was growing quite, uh, quite impressively. Uh, it was growing from uh, less than $10, uh, about $12, uh, per barrel uh, to uh, $30 per barrel uh, uh, within also a very limited period of time. Uh, and it continued to grow, as we know. It's now much higher than that, so it continued to grow. Uh, so uh, you get more resources. Also, all major pieces of the pie are already divided. So there is no reason to fight uh, each other. There is not much uh, to fight about. Because all pieces are divided, now it's better to stabilize uh, the system and everybody would be interested in uh, keeping uh, the acquired pieces, at least. Of course, there were a few ones who misbehaved, like uh, Boris Berezovsky or Vladimir Gusinsky, or later Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who wanted to continue uh, to run their businesses and to run Russian politics uh, the same way as it used to be in the 1990s. They were punished. And of course, uh, when they were punished, they claimed that uh, they kind of defeated freedom and democracy. Uh, but of course, that was not true because these people had nothing to do with freedom or democracy. Uh, they were defending their own specific interests, including their vision of uh, their oligarchic freedoms, like their oligarchic freedom to, to do whatever they want, not even taking care about the other oligarchs not even taking into consideration what other oligarchs wanted uh, to, to be done. And uh, that leads to the situation when a few excessive characters were kind of wiped out, but the rest of the oligarchy was extremely happy with what happened because of course now it's calm, now it's stable, now everyone keeps what he or she has, uh, which is good. Uh, and now uh, the state is going also to be very stable to protect uh, the acquired uh, property. And, the, uh, and that's one thing. The second aspect, uh, so, so now you have a coalition. Instead of competition of the oligarchs, now have a coalition of the oligarchs. That's, that's very important. The second aspect is uh, that uh, the management of the acquired assets, of the acquired property, should be rationalized. So instead of chaotic and anarchic competition, now we have uh, kind of Weberian bureaucratic management of the assets of the corporations. Corporations were restructured, reorganized, organized in a more uh, logical, more rational and more disciplined way. So the whole process of uh, management is uh, rationalized and uh, reorganized. Uh, restructured. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we speak about the corporate stage, uh, that capitalism became corporate. And the, uh, the third aspect, which was also very important, was that while the resources were uh, becoming uh, 
uh, increasingly uh, uh, in, in, increasingly uh, uh, subs uh, what let's put it uh, I shouldn't say uh, excessive but sufficient uh, becoming sufficient for the uh, normalization of the reproduction of the society as a whole. Uh, that was a period when uh, the welfare uh, of the people also increased. So um, social spending of the uh, government increased uh, by more than 10 times in, in, in numbers. And even in real, uh, in real figures, it, it increased quite substantially. Even if you can just compare that with inflation, still you see that there was a very serious, really massive increase of social spending. Uh, of course, there were more and better jobs, and so on, and so on. Uh, there was more spending on education, for example. Uh, so that led to the situation when uh, people started getting satisfied. Even those groups which were uh, more uh, impoverished in the Yeltsin years. Uh, started getting better off. And by the way, even th these groups are now among the most stable and the most supportive for the current regime, uh, because at least the older generation remembers the, uh, how bad it was for them in the 1990s. So uh, so this is that leads to a paradox that some of the most impoverished groups of Russian society uh, the poorest uh, groups and most depressive areas uh, of Russian uh, uh, of the country. Uh, these are the exactly the bulwarks for the support for the current regime. Uh, partly because they remember how bad it used to be before. Uh, partly because they are becoming increasingly dependent on uh, uh, some kind of uh, paternalistic government welfare which has very little to do with uh, the real welfare state in the social democratic sense because it doesn't evolve doesn't involve sorry doesn't involve any democratic control doesn't involve any any rights uh, for those people who get uh, the benefits uh, they don't have any rights it's just about the good uh, bureaucrats from the top giving them some money to survive but that makes them even more dependent as you can imagine there is no no, almost no right. It's always about um, their uh, goodwill of the bosses, goodwill of the state, goodwill of the uh, of the uh, of the bureaucracy, uh, which accepts uh, the fact that some people have to survive. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the system was stabilized, and that was the golden age for Putin and his uh, people. Also, some new oligarchs emerged. So some of the old oligarchs were uh, wiped out, but some of the new oligarchs emerged uh, who were also very close to, uh, close to Putin personally. And uh, still, you should understand that during that period, Putin was not that important as an individual. He was very important symbolically. He was very important as a final arbiter for all sorts of debates and or disputes within the elite, but that was about it. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, uh, Putin was uh, not a dictator. He was more like a, a, a traditional, uh, traditional chief for for the oligarchic uh, extended family kind of. And uh, of course, during that period of time, uh, politically, what we have, what we used to have, what politically, what we used to have is uh, what they called sovereign or managed or controlled democracy, which means that uh, you can have elections, uh, you can have uh, free press, uh, at least to some extent, uh, not on television. There, is no, there was no freedom on television, but the press, okay, you can publish an opposition newspaper, you can organize rallies, uh, protesting against something, you can... Uh, organize uh, political meetings and debates and so on. Uh, one thing which is uh, important, uh, you should not try to take power. Uh, you can discuss, you can criticize, but it doesn't affect the, the power system. The power is in the hands of those people 
who have the power and they're not going to uh, to let anyone uh, touch it. And of course, so to some extent, that that's happening in, in the West as well, in the, the in the capitalist democracies as well. But in the capitalist democracies, at least, it's about the the class power. Uh, in the Russian case, it's not just the class power of the ruling uh, elite; it's also about the individual power of every single uh, personality of every, every single group of this political class. So they're not going to let anyone to. Uh, to try to take uh, the posi positions, their seats away from them. Of course, opposition uh, used to have its quotas. There were certain cases when opposition actually exceeded the, the designed quotas. So there were conflicts about that. Mm, there were cases when uh, there were surprise elections, so to speak, when all of a sudden opposition candidates won elections with they shouldn't have won, uh, shouldn't have win. I should have won, sorry, I should have won. Uh, but, uh, but uh, of course, uh, in, in general, these uh, uh, cases were regulated and uh, taken care of. And uh, on that peaked about 2007, when, of course, there was another interesting element that uh, Putin ha had to be replaced by uh, Dmitry Medvedev as the president, but stayed over as the prime minister, and then later, as you know, Medvedev was again replaced by Putin himself, and uh, turned, he was uh, moved back into the position of the prime minister. There was kind of a uh, funny exchange of positions, which didn't, didn't make any, any big difference. But uh, the Great Recession uh, suddenly uh, changed the rules of the game internationally, because on the one hand, uh, Russian uh, oligarchy experienced a real collapse. Russian economy started deteriorating and really collapsed in the in 2009. It was a real, real uh, catastrophe. Uh, but uh, by that time, they discovered that they accumulated a, acquired enormous reserves, which were used to save the corporations, especially the state played uh, a central, as everywhere, but... Uh, it was very visible. Uh, the state played a central role in their uh, operation, save uh, save the big businesses, which are, which were, uh, as you know, too big to fail. Uh, so that was the very same logic as everywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, then uh, uh, the behavior of both of the private business and of the state uh, changed. So after this, that, since uh, 2010, approximately 2011, the very idea of uh, uh, sharing uh, some of the benefits with the people was completely forgotten. Uh, now it was totally different. Uh, we have to continue accumulating reserves for the future crisis if it comes back. The very idea that the crisis was going to come back was haunting Russian elites and, well, probably until uh, 2020, uh, 2022 when something much worse happened. And uh, uh, so that means that uh, they kept accumulating more and more reserves, more and more resources, financial resources. So there was no money left for the people. So in that sense, the original social contract was broken, uh, but in, also there was enormous inertia. So in that sense, the situation of the people didn't start deteriorating very fast. It was gradually and slowly deteriorating, but uh, it was not some kind of social collapse. It was just some stagnation. Uh, the Russian economy recovered from the Great Recession and not into economic growth, but into stagnation. And it was stagnating for, for another 10 years. Uh, also for the obvious reason, uh, the money was uh, taken away from the economy. The economy was disinvested and the money was accumulated uh, in different reserve funds, both private and public. Uh, most of these reserves fund, reserve funds were also uh, moved abroad. Uh, but that also led to another very interesting aspect of Russian uh, economic development, which I uh, mentioned before, which was this overaccumulation of the capital. This Luxembourgian moment, let's put it this way. Uh, 
Uh, what was uh, wrong about it? Well, first of all, of course, Russian uh, economy suffers from enormous disinvestment, especially in terms of infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure, is, uh, provincial infrastructure is a disaster. Uh, there, there is not enough money to generate uh, good jobs and so on and so on. But at the same time, uh, there is too much money uh, for the big businesses, for the big corporations who have problems. And also uh, the state has problems, what, or at least used to have problems till very recently, till the, till the war with Ukraine. It used to have problems with, with this excessive money, which they continue to accumulate, but you have to do something with the, these uh, huge amounts of money, which, which are uh, put into different reserves. And uh, so in that sense, again, uh, well, this audience here knows quite well the, the, the concepts of Rosa Luxemburg, so I don't have to develop them into detail. Uh, what is important that Russian economy was start was uh, suffering from the lack of investment at the bottom and overaccumulation crisis at the top, which is also very typical for the economies of the periphery. I think is in that sense. Uh, I don't. I don't think that I'm telling you some story which is completely unknown. Uh, but uh, what to do with this money? It has to be used in one way or another. And, uh, uh, of course, by the way, when we look at Russian oligarchs building all these yachts and palaces and uh, buying palaces in, in Europe, I don't know, hotels and uh, building uh, some strange mansions, grotesque, um, grotesque buildings, uh, this also quite typical for their overaccumulation crisis because you do not invest this money into the economy but you have to do something with this money and it's too much money so you use it this way this stupid way but it's important to know that the state was doing exactly the same the state was also overloaded with money and at the same time when there were people asking uh, to increase social spending uh, there was this uh, uh this famous uh Phrase of uh, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, which one, once he was met by a group of people who were asking for uh, to help with, with some social spending, and he said, "There is no money, but you you should keep going." Uh, so, well, okay, uh, keep going, uh, but there is no money for you. For them, there was quite a lot of money, and also in that sense, you should understand the corruption is also. Uh, a logical consequence of this overaccumulation, because what to do with the money, what to do with this excessive money, among other things, you have to redistribute this money through stealing this money. It's quite logical. It's also one way of re uh, redistributing uh, and using this money, uh, especially in the state sector. Uh, there were grotesque stories, like uh, at, at one point, one a uh, medium-level police officer was arrested for corruption charges. He, he was called Colonel Zakharchenko, so not even a general, Colonel Zakharchenko. So he was not any kind of top figure in the system. He was a medium-level, probably important figure, but not at the very top uh, level. So uh, this Zakharchenko was arrested for corruption charges. Then they, uh, the, uh, when he was arrested, they discovered that he had another flat. So he was the, there was a flat where he lived, and he uh, also bought another flat. What did he buy it for? It buy it just to store money. When they came into this flat, it was just a big flat. It was just full of, of money, just just bills, that just a dollar and ruble, uh, and hundred dollar bills. There were piled there. There were millions of dollars just piled physically there. Like uh, Scrooge McDuck in the in the ah uh, in, in the famous cartoon uh, Disney cartoons about duck tales, so that was exactly physically like that. I, and there were other cases which are very similar, like uh, the governor of Penza, um, Belazertsu, was also arrested for corruption charges, and then he, they discovered that he had a basement, and the basement was just there to keep. Uh, money uh, and watches, just dozens of watches. Uh, 
uh, Swiss watches, I mean, very, very expensive ones, $20,000, $50,000, uh, $200 each piece, like that. Uh, he just piled them, piled. Uh, there was no use for, for all these pieces. Uh, but that's uh, the grotesque, uh, grotesque side stories. But of course, serious people also had to do something more serious. And one uh, option was to in to invest uh, this money, but to invest it abroad. And here we are coming to the issue of Russian imperialism, or rather sub-imperialism, peripheric sub-imperialism, or imperialism on the periphery. Because on the one hand, you see a very typical economy of the periphery. But on the other hand, uh, at the very same time, you see uh, that there was money, and the money was invested, among other things, to buy out assets in the neighboring post-Soviet countries. Also, it's much easier and cheaper than to build something in Russia. With this very same money, you can go into Ukraine, for example, and uh, Belarus as well. By the way, with Belarus, it was more difficult because Belarusian bureaucracy, led by uh, Alexander Lukashenko, was uh, very carefully protecting its own industries and its own interests. And to some extent, Belarus remained a, a rather industrial uh, country, partly also because Belarus didn't have uh, much uh, of uh, resources to offer uh, the global economy. It was just trying to exploit the Russian market uh, selling industrial goods into Russia where there was a lot of dollars. And uh, Ukraine is, uh, is a very specific case uh, because U Ukraine didn't possess excessive labor force like say Uzbekistan, for example. Uh, so Uzbekistan, for example, exported labor force uh, well into Russia and to some other places. Uh, South Korea, for example. Uh, it didn't possess mineral resources like Russia. Uh, so Ukrainian capitalism was poor capitalism. There was this famous joke in the, 19, uh, so in the late 1990s, which continued to be uh, very, very... Uh, true even in the 2000s, what's the difference between a Russian oligarch and, a, and an Ukrainian oligarch? Oh, Russian oligarch has money. You see, so Ukraine had poor oligarchs. Oh, well, they were pretty, pretty rich in our terms, but compared to Russian oligarchs, they were poor. Uh, so they were uh, looking for uh, the protection uh, of the West to defend themselves from the Russian expansion. Uh, which is also very logical. So Russian oligarchy, Russian capitalism was expanding aggressively to Ukraine. Ukrainian capitalists, uh, to some, some uh, well, they were divided into two factions. One faction was actually uh, cooperating with uh, with the Russian expansion, with, uh, with the colleagues from the East, cooperating with them, uh, trying to get their share of, the, uh, of this operation uh, of takeover of Ukrainian assets and uh, Ukrainian infrastructure and so on. And other groups were trying to resist this uh, Russian uh, capitalist offensive. And of course, they were uh, trying to get Western, uh, Western oligarchs, Western corporations uh, as the allies to protect themselves against Russian expansion uh, at the cost of also surrendering what remained of their Sovereignty. So in that sense, Ukraine was definitely surrendering its sovereignty, at least at the economic level, either to the east or to the west. But there was also a battle between different groups fighting about the issue uh, to whom to surrender the sovereignty. And, uh, well, as we know, it led to the uh, famous crisis of 2013-2014, when Ukrainian state actually de facto collapsed. Ukraine became a failed state for a period of time. Now it is not a failed state anymore, but it used to be a failed state about 2014, 2015. Uh, when, of course, uh, protests and riots uh, uh, started around the whole country, and there were uh, riots um, in the East and riots in the West, and they had uh, totally different political uh, tendencies and by the way, it's also very interesting to uh, point uh, to to uh, to to point out two things that uh, Ukraine politically and ideologically in many ways uh, kind of was frozen in the 1990s for the reasons which you already understood. Uh, 
And Russia uh, changed ideologically uh, because, as I told you, in the 1990s, they were anti-communist, anti-Soviet. Uh, but in 2010, 2014, uh, it was different. Uh, Russian capitalists who already acquired all these enterprises and assets and uh, resources, they were now praising Soviet Union, but kind of praising Soviet Union without communism. So the good thing about the Soviet Union was, Union was it that it was also a kind of empire. The bad thing was it, that it was still some kind of communist uh, empire which didn't have private property and so on and so on. And uh, so the good thing about Stalin was that he had Gulag and uh, uh, the and Kavade, the security police. These were good things. The bad thing was about educational educating these peasants and workers and uh, give them too much access to the to the top top jobs in the, in the industries and so on. So so the Union, according to this new ideology, was was good but too democratic, too excessively democratic. So that that was bad about the Soviet Union. Uh, so in that sense, uh, so you here you meet uh, also this kind of ideological uh, ideological conflict. Uh, the two uh, you discovered this ideological conflict in Ukraine. They were still in the nineties, so they were still uh, ex uh, kind of promoting this extreme anti-communist and extreme anti. Soviet ideology, Soviet Union was as I say, uh, rehabilitated partly in Russia, uh, and in that sense you can fly the red flag, for example, but uh, don't say anything about, say, anti-capitalism or about, say, uh, the interests of the workers and so on and so on. Uh, so in that sense, there was also this famous ideological clash between Russia and Ukraine and uh, their, their elites as well. Uh, so the Ukrainian uh, state collapsed, so uh, uh, Putin uh, used the opportunity, and not just Putin, but this whole Russian elite used the opportunity to take over Crimea. But by the way, Crimean population applauded that. They really uh, were fed up with Ukrainian disasters, which happened year after year after year. So that says the, the annexation of Crimea uh, was happening very easily with the support of the local population. It's very important to understand that fact. Uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk, it happened in a different way, partly because uh, the Kremlin and Russian elites didn't want to annex uh, Donetsk or Lugansk at that point. Uh, and that was also the source of frustration for those groups of people, quite numerous groups of people who wanted to be annexed, but they failed to be annexed on the Russian side. And anyhow, we since then we have this growing and ongoing conflict with Ukraine, and uh, this is exactly the 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 nature, the political economy of Russian sub-imperialism, as I uh, I'm trying to explain to you how how did it emerge and what's the what's the meaning of it, what's the reason for it to to, to function this way, uh, and of course then you go into the logic of the conflict itself. So finally, before uh, finishing the whole story, uh, now we have to look at the uh, at the current period, and the current period is uh, when we first have we first have the, the COVID, and then we have the, this Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, I think these are just elements of our much broader picture. It was just elements of the global crisis of the neoliberal model. I think it's much more than this. Uh, a Russian-Ukrainian story. It's uh, uh, certain aspects of the global crisis, and we just experienced this global crisis through uh, through the war. Uh, I think it's a kind of uh, local war with potentially global consequences because also it uh, happens in the time when capitalism is undergoing yet another crisis. It's going undergoing another process of inevitable and very painful restructuring. Uh, and, uh, well, in the case of Russia, it was accompanied uh, by uh, the tremendous legitimacy, legitimacy crisis of the Russian state about 2020-2022, when uh, Putin's popularity was declining. Uh, as I told you before, the population was unhappy with uh, declining living standards for years after years after years. 
the legitimacy of the system was also questioned. Uh, they kept losing every single election. Uh, of course, electoral fraud uh, was the only solution. So uh, electoral fraud uh, is becoming an institutionalized, by the way, Russian uh, electoral legislation is very particular because by like 2020, they introduced new electoral legislation, which is specially uh, designed to facilitate fraud. So in that sense, electoral fraud is not a nexus or is not something which is breaking the law. Uh, contrary to that, uh, counting properly is like going against the law, you see. Uh, so counting votes is uh, is illegal kind of in Russia. Yeah, I, I don't, it's not a joke. There are special mechanisms which prevent counting votes, you see. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that led to the to the crisis, domestic crisis, which no, is not often seen from abroad, especially in, in the West. Uh, Russian society is presented as almost uh, monolithic, or they say there is there are some dissidents like like Boris Kagalitsky, for example. But the rest of society is just just monolithically behind Putin. It's total nonsense. On the contrary. The uh, society is uh, very divided and very unhappy. And when you have such a domestic crisis, one of the possible solutions is to start a war. Because once you start a war, you can restructure the society and state the way you like. Unfortunately, you often lose these wars, which you start because of domestic reasons. Uh, it's uh, finally, uh, speaking about the periphery, central periphery conflict, uh, it's the model of the Fontlands War, more or less, or to some extent, it's the first uh, Gulf War, when uh, a state of the one of the strongest strongest state uh, in the periphery suddenly tries to behave in an arrogant way, uh, getting outside of its niche, getting outside of its sphere uh, of of accepted influences influence, and uh, affecting the interests of the of the of the bigger brother. They are, oh, they're all big brothers, but this is the bigger brother. Uh, one big brother is uh, is actually uh, acting in such a way that it affects the, the interests of well, another brother who is even bigger, another big brother who is even bigger than this one. A and uh, so what we have, it was also the Crimean War in, in the 19th century, when Russia, uh, Russia's state started with uh, attacking the Ottoman Empire, Thinking, okay, we'll do away with this, uh, with this uh, ill, ill Europe's ill men, uh, men, men Europe, by nature like Europe, men, men, uh, person of Europe, men, uh, sorry, uh, uh, ill men of Europe or sick men of Europe, as they called Turkey. Uh, instead, they ended up fighting uh, not just with Turkey, but starting fighting with, uh, with England, with France, with Piedmont, and so on. Uh, and uh, hopefully avoiding fighting with Austria. Uh, so this is very much the same story. They started the war, they thought they would do away with the trade within three or four days, maybe two weeks. Uh, they failed. They failed. They are, they are now defeated. We are in, now facing probably one of the worst defeats in Russian history, and was the most one of the mo and definitely the most humiliating defeat because we are technically at least we are not defeated by say France or England like in the 19th century, not even by German like in the 20, early 20th century, but with, by Ukraine, which used to be yet another Soviet so Republic, and much smaller one and much weaker one, of course backed by the West. And uh, well, I think the big domestic crisis is going to erupt, and maybe it's the the the, the prologue for for yet another Russian revolution. Period. <laughs> well, thank you, Boris. That was very interesting. Um, okay, uh, we I guess uh, another fifteen minutes or so, uh, or maybe twenty. Um, Anyone who has any questions, uh, the way it works, as you know, if you are familiar with the software, is you raise your hands to ask questions. And uh, yeah, uh, I see one yes. from Sinan. Go ahead, Sinan. Can you... I don't hear anything. Huh? No. Now? 
Yes. Yes. Um, Professor, thank you. This uh, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I am so happy to meet with you uh, under this uh, sem uh, seminar since uh, as a uh, defender uh, and a follower of uh, Immanuel Wallerstein uh, to learn uh, Russia's history from world system theory uh, is a, a huge uh, experience for me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for this experience. Um, actually, I have uh, several questions. Uh, nevertheless, as I uh, remember, uh, I can try uh, to ask. Uh, firstly, uh, as I remember, uh, maybe Yevgeny Primakov or uh, another uh, former uh, Russia prime minister during uh, Boris Yeltsin stated that uh, Russia's main problem was Uh, dependency on uh, oil reven uh, revenues, oil income, uh, despite its uh, industrial capacity, since we, uh, when we uh, compare its uh, industrial capacity with the uh, United States and other uh, core Western capitalist countries, uh, is not enough uh, to become uh, a superpower in the world system. Mm -hmm. uh, from this perspective, can we say that Uh, especially when we look at uh, the course of uh, Ukraine war, uh, Russia uh, faces with the same problem mainly uh, since uh, during P uh, Putin era, uh, Russia economy, uh, according to many scholars, uh, became more dependent on uh, oil uh, industry when we compared uh, early uh, period of uh, russian uh, russia Fe uh, federation uh, compos uh, economic composition was more uh, other industries than uh, oil and natural gas uh, for now uh, what do you say uh, about that well uh, of course uh, i had to bypass the very short period of evgeny primakov because uh, Evgeny Promokos really did try uh, to develop a different strategy, which uh, contradicted the interests of the oil oligarchy, of the raw materials oligarchy. And he was defeated and uh, politically destroyed. And since then, uh, the country moved back. There was this uh, strategy of depending on oil and uh, not just oil, gas, uh, uh, forestry, a lot of raw materials, but basically uh, that was this kind of integration which was based on raw materials exports. And this is classical, yes, it's a classical uh, dependency path. And uh, not, even, uh, not even necessarily, it's, it's definitely peripheric kind of development, but it's even within the periphery, some countries Uh, did uh, did better kind of, uh, or they had a much more uh, complex uh, strategy within the periphery. Uh, so it's not only the the periphery strategy, but it's also a kind of uh, very primitive, uh, uh, but very easy strategy for a country which uh, possessed a lot of raw materials, a lot of uh, minerals, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, yes, by the way, speaking about Wallerstein and perspective. I just uh, remind you that I have uh, this book, Empire on the Periphery, which is basically presenting the history of Russia from the, the world system uh, perspective. Uh, let me, uh, before uh, letting Sinan continue, um, con I believe he has uh, more questions. Uh, the way I met uh, Boris uh, in 2008, 9, or whatever year that was, um, Through world system theorists, a friend of mine, Jeff uh, Summers. Jeff Summers. Summers, yeah. Um, that I met uh, on an email list where there were world system theorists uh, said that, look, the, this guy, Boris, is coming to New York. Can he stay at your place? And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> uh, so, world system theory, among other things, plays uh, such an Connecting important role. <laughs> 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 anyway, go ahead, Sinan. Uh, Hojam, also, uh, despite the uh, Soviet Union is identified as the uh, one of two superpowers in the world uh, after the uh, Second World War, uh, 
its industrial capacity is not enough. Uh, can we say that is uh, its industrial capacity uh, was not enough actually to be labeled as a, a superpower uh, since uh, being hegemonic uh, country in the world system, the main condition was uh, uh, being leader of industrial production. Yes, I know uh, after uh, 1970s, Soviet Union passed uh, over United States. But uh, 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 during that year, United States economy uh, converted into from uh, industrial uh, industry oriented economy to finance oriented economy uh, how can we uh, define uh, the condition of uh, soviet union in the world system in terms of being uh, the hegemon country well first of all i think here is the point where i kind of disagree with emmanuel wallaston uh, because he saw soviet union as part of the world economy uh, i think that uh, Russian, uh, sorry, Soviet Union was uh, more like in in Wallastinian terms again, opposing Wallenstein uh, in in Wallastinian terms. It was more like a, a, a world em, a world empire rather than part of the world system. As you remember, Wallenstein is uh, uh, proposing two models: uh, the model of world's empires which were separate from each other, which could exchange goods and commodities, but uh, which were not structured as one piece, right? As one system. And world system, which was just one big system where everybody had its own element, its own role uh, and niche and so on. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in that sense, the relations of the Soviet Union to the world system were more like that of, uh, of a world empire to a world system. And also Soviet Union tried to establish its own minor world system, uh, socialist world system, uh, it was called this way, socialist world system, uh, which was, in, by the way, it was not, not such, uh, such a failed, uh, such a failed uh, structure as it used to be presented later. There were some contradictions within the system, which uh, led to its breakdown, of course. Uh, so there were very serious weaknesses within this uh, construct. Uh, but up to some point, it, it worked reasonably well, up to some point. And uh, then you have to go in deeper into the discussion about the inner contradictions of the Soviet system which were separate uh, compared to, to the contradiction of the global capitalist system. I don't think the Soviet Union was capitalist. Soviet Union was not capitalist. It was not socialist either. To my point, it was not socialist, but it was not capitalist. It was somewhere, uh, I shouldn't say in between, it was something special, something very uh, specific. Uh, and we still have to discuss it in, in more detail what kind of society was it. Uh, but... Uh, in that sense, uh, the Soviet Union actually failed the competition uh, by the late 60s. Uh, why? Because it failed the reform, the, uh, suppressing the Prague Spring, suppressing the economic reform of the USSR. Uh, conservative bureaucracy also failed the Soviet economy and failed the, the competition uh, with, with the West. And then, of course, then you know the, the end of the story. Uh, after all this, uh, can we say that uh, Russia's main uh, historical strategy uh, is being world empire, despite a uh, world system uh, overweights uh, to uh, world empire? In no, terms of it, it can be seen as it can be seen as Stalin's strategy. But again, I just recommend you to read my book Empire on the Periphery where you just see that a lot of struggle of the Russian uh, Russian uh, empire of the of the St. Petersburg state was about uh, getting a better place within the world system, uh, which, which they all, sometimes succeeded, but mostly failed, sometimes succeeded. So there were some success stories. And uh, uh, again, there were some contradictions within Russian society itself. Uh, 
which uh, prevented it uh, acquiring the global uh, the global goals uh, within the world system uh, because uh, Russian elites on the one hand wanted to exploit uh, their own uh, peripheric condition peripheric structures as a specific competitive benefit vis-a-vis -vis their Western opponents. Uh, but that led to this contradiction, because on the one hand, you want to be part of the center and want to uh, to influence the center. Uh, but on the other hand, your competitive advantage is what can be seen as your periphery condition, like, uh, for example, serfdom. You exploit serf uh, peasants, uh, so which makes you able uh, to acquire uh, very cheap goods and very cheap resources and, uh, and 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 cheap soldiers among other things but once you uh, once you get into a serious competition with with the west then you discover that your your own structures uh, are uh, dependent on the west okay thank you professor okay um we have about a few more minutes i i believe uh, any other question Uh, Michael Keeney uh, sends a very long question. Uh, Michael's uh, the problem with Michael's uh, connection is that uh, he's not uh, able to use uh, his mic uh, as far as I remember from the uh, microphone as well. As I recall from oh, I see, no, no. The argument, I, I, I've got the text. The okay, argument good. about NATO expansion uh, is very often used by uh, some of the Western left, but the argument is, uh, I shouldn't say it's wrong, but it's uh, over. It's an overstatement. Let me be very clear. Uh, NATO expansion was uh, taking place mostly in the early 2000s, when Putin was very happy with uh, with NATO, Putin himself confessed that he wanted to join NATO. And, uh, and later they tried to exploit their uh, contradictions within NATO, like having some kind of uh, uh, access with Berlin and, and Paris against Washington, as you remember, in the early 2000s. Uh, but never, never they saw and never they saw NATO expansion as a major as a major threat. Don't forget another point that, uh, for example, during the war in Afghanistan, American war in Afghanistan, uh, there was a military base uh, in in Russia, as far as I remember, it was somewhere in 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 the Urals, which was essential for the NATO operation in Afghanistan, for example, and so on. So, uh, I don't want to say that uh, Russian R Russia's Putin's relations with NATO were so uh, uh, idyllic, uh, but uh, there were problems, but not so difficult, not so serious problems, um, and uh, uh, their uh, confrontation with the West uh, increased exactly when the Ukrainian crisis erupted, for the reasons which I described. It was not about anything else. It was not about the Baltics. It was not about NATO uh, entering the Baltic Republic. So uh, NATO entered Baltic Republic, they joined NATO, so what? Well, of course, there were some minor noises in the propaganda, but nothing more than that. Uh, Estonia is much closer uh, to the major centers of Russian Federation than uh, than Ukraine, actually. you know, From Estonia, it's... Uh, it's a few minutes flight uh, to St. Petersburg. Don't forget that. And uh, that was not a big problem. Uh, nobody expected NATO aircraft to attack uh, St. Petersburg from, from Tallinn, eh? no, though it, it, it's technically extremely easy. Uh, and then they said Ukraine joining NATO would be a big problem. Uh, no, the problem was not with Ukraine joining NATO, especially because NATO didn't want Ukraine to join. The problem was about the competition between Russian and Western capital within Ukraine. That was the real problem, and uh, that, that's the, the real political economy of the conflict. Um, Michael, uh, do you want to... 
continue with some additional questions? I would like to say that the analysis of the political economy of the Ukrainian problem is one that I completely agree with. But the the I mean only yesterday Finland joined NATO. So there's another expansion with a much larger border with Russia. And efforts continue to bring Sweden into NATO as well. And the placement of weapons in Poland and further east than during the previous Cold War is also of concern to the Russian state leadership. So I, I wonder to what extent is this issue being underestimated in the analysis of the lead up, the, the reasons behind the attack on Ukraine last year? Well, that that that's uh, that has no 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 consistency with the attack, uh, because you see what did happen in 2022, which didn't happen, say in 2020 or 2019. You know, there was no more NATO expansion in 2022 than it was in say 2020. Uh, it didn't care. Uh, nobody cared. Nobody in Moscow cared about NATO. In 2020, not a word. If you listen to Russian television, uh, they didn't they didn't even mention NATO for years till the very moment when they decided to invade Ukraine. Uh, so uh, that that didn't make any any difference. Uh, again, speaking about uh, Finland joining NATO, Finland is joining NATO because of Putin's miscalculation. Putin miscalculated heavily. heavily. They expected Ukraine to collapse within days, and then, of course, they then they could make a deal with the West, saying maybe we can divide Ukraine into pieces. For example, that uh, that's a very typical idea in in Russian state propaganda, like dividing Ukraine the way Poland was divided uh, in the 18th and 19th century. So, like maybe if the West wants, uh, let them have a piece uh, in the Western Ukraine. Maybe Poland would take over Hungary, would take over a piece, and so on. Or or do some kind of division Ukraine into two separate states, one controlled by the uh, West, another controlled by Russia. These were strategies behind that. So it was it had nothing to do with NATO. NATO was a very good pretext for domestic propaganda, and surprisingly, it is also accepted by some of the Western progressives. I understand why, because NATO is a, is a reactionary bloc. Definitely, we have no reason to say anything good about NATO. Uh, so in that sense, once we say anything bad about NATO, it's it's easily so, uh, taken by, by, the, by the Western liberal left. But uh, it's not this particular case. It's a uh, uh, ironically, it's exactly Putin's strategy, Putin's activities, which now led uh, to NATO expansion. Uh, Finland is now in NATO, Sweden is going to be in NATO, most probably Ukraine is going to be in NATO soon. Uh, who made it? Uh, Putin made it because of, of his uh, uh, miscalculation, which itself had reasons within uh, the, the, the Russian political economy. Um, I guess, uh, any other questions? Uh, Sabri, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm a bit tired because I did... Uh... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Uh, indeed, we are all, already five minutes over time. Yeah. Uh, Maybe uh, we are going to, to end up here. That's what I was going to suggest. Uh, that, that's why I asked that question. Anyway, uh, Thank you for this uh, presentation, uh, for joining us uh, tonight. And uh, I'm sure I'll meet you again in the future. Absolutely. And, uh, well. If we survive. <laughs> bye for now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Much. Okay, bye.